My name is Ilya, I work at Google. Uh, I'm part of the team that works on Clang-based developer tools. Uh, we created things like Clang Format, Clang Tidy, uh, and other things as well, like Clang Refactor. Uh, but today I want to talk about uh, the new tool that we've been working on for about a year now, uh, a little more than that, uh, which is called Clang D. And uh, Clang D is a language server uh, that provides semantical features for C++ and other languages in your editor, like code completion, go to definition, things like that. Uh, just a small overview of the talk. We will start with looking at the uh, protocol that powers Clang D, like the core technology that it is based on. Uh, then we'll uh, take a look at what Clang D is uh, with a close focus on implementation on one of the features inside it, which is the code completion, and we'll conclude with future plans uh, for Clang D that we have. Uh, so let's actually start not with Clang D, but the standard protocol behind it that powers it. Um, it is called the Language Server Protocol. It was introduced by Microsoft, and Microsoft still maintains it. Uh, the problem that it is, it is trying to solve uh, strives from this observation. Uh, so if you want to get features like code completion for different languages and different editors, you end up with a situation where you need to implement support for every language in every editor out there. And you end up with a whole bunch of plugins <clears throat> and you naturally want to have that because you want semantic features for people using every editor for your language. Uh, but it is clear that a lot of work in this matrix can actually be reused between the, between the implementations. So uh, on one dimension, you have the same editors. And uh, if you want to re-implement support for different languages and save them, uh, then you will run into the same problems over and over again. You will need to find a way to write Vim script to interact with your user. Uh, you will uh, want to implement the completion window. You will want to have the same experience for features like go to definition, and things like that. Uh, some of the things might not be available in the editor and you would want to also extend the editor to do that. And if you don't share code on this dimension, you end up with uh, situations where users have different experience if they use Java plugins in Vim or, and C Sharp plugins in Vim. And this is not ideal and it's also a repetition of a lot of work. Uh, it might be even worse in the other dimension. If you want to build support for C++ in every major editor, uh, then you may end up repeating the work to do uh, C++ parsing or implementing code completion in C++. And this is probably not the thing that you're going to do because it will just take a lot of work and probably you don't have all the time in the world to, say, build separate C++ engines for Emacs and Vim. Uh, and you might say that this is not actually a problem for C++. We know that we for a while now had a lot of plugins that did C++ code completion and other features. And they were all based on Clang, uh, either directly or via stable interface that Big Clang provides. So it might seem that the problem has already been solved a while ago. Uh, Big Clang provides C++ parser, features like code completion, and gives you a stable C interface. So it might seem that like Make implementing every plugin, every of those plugins out there is just super easy now and doesn't require a lot of work. But I would disagree with that. That's not actually true. What Clip Clang, what Clip Clang does is it makes implementations of those plugins feasible. It doesn't mean that it makes the implementations of those plugins easy. First problem that you run into is that editors are not usually extensible direct, directly in C you will still need to write a C, plus, a C or C++ binary to merge together libclang and uh, a new editor. Uh, some of the plugins, like AirTags, also add a lot of features on top of libclang. They use it internally, but they will build 
project-wide index for you, and they will do features like global cross-references across different files, and it ends up to be a, a lot of implementation work, and sharing it with other editors becomes non-trivial because now you have the Emacs plugin, and AirTags works there, but you don't really have the one for them. You have to re-implement it from scratch again. And this was the key observation that people who implemented the language server protocol made. They said, we really want to distinguish between the language servers that provide semantic features for the language and the editors, or how they call them, LSP clients, which provide the UI for the, for the user to use those, those, those features. And then those can be implemented by completely separate people, and uh, the clients will be able to focus on things like better UIs and better user interactions, supporting more features in the, more like giving better UX for the, for the features, while the language servers can focus on the problems of parsing the language and doing all the semantic stuff. So, a separation like that gives, uh, makes it good for the users, because now if your editor implements the client interface, you will get consistent user experience for all of the languages that, are, that have a language server. Uh, but it also makes the life a whole lot easier for the tool developers, because now you don't need to care about every editor out there and you don't even need to know VimScript or Elisp to do code completion for C++ or Rust or any other language. And this is where Clang falls in that, in that diagram. It is a language server for C++, and it uses the standard request response protocol to talk to the clients and provide all the features. Um, it is not the first attempt to do this, uh, surely this observation has been made before. Uh, you Complete Me is one of the examples that kind of did the similar thing. Uh, you might, you, you probably all at least have heard of it. Uh, with You Complete Me, you have the editor plugins and then you talk via HTTP to the server, which then dispatches the request to the computers. And computers are language specific, so you kind of get the same separation. Uh, the big difference with LSP is that now it gained, I would say, much more momentum than YCM. Uh, it is supported in all the major editors and it has more features and the features are being actively added, so it seems to be a somewhat better choice if you want to provide a language server for many languages. Um, so back to, to the tool that we've, we've been actually implementing for a while now. Uh, Clang started as a, because of a few reasons. Our team is responsible at Google for providing the default editor features for, for the Google developers. And before Clang D, we had the default option of using uComplete.me. That created some pain for us to support it because we didn't really own the code for the C++ part of it that used libclang, and then it was transferred to us, and it was a bit of a pain to support because it, is, it means that we had to, like every time it crashed, we had to debug and mix it uh, C++ and Python binary, and I haven't really experienced that, but my colleagues tell me that this is not a very nice experience and you want to avoid that if you can. Uh, the other problem that we had is uh, that we started coming up with, with ideas on how to improve uh, things like code completion, and we started making those tools that provide refactorings for C++. We had Clang Tidy, and we wanted to integrate all of that into your editor, but it was clear that the current code in the You Complete Me wasn't extensible, and it, was, it would be hard for us to uh, make it work without rewriting it from scratch. And at the same time, we saw that LSP was gaining traction. So our team started Clang D as a, as a way to 
do all of those things to ease the, the support path for us and also to add all those new features. So we currently uh, have Plan D that supports some of the pretty useful features. You can use it now and get all of that. Uh, most of them are local file specific, so you won't get some of the project-wide features like find definition. We're working on that. Uh, but our focus with Clang D is uh, build those new features that we anticipated. One of those is improved code completion, and I will talk about that later in the talk. The other thing is we want to make Clang D the default choice at Google for people writing C++. Uh, we want the experience of the developers to be good when they use it, so we also want to make it work at Google scale. Uh, it means that we want to support, like all the features that we support, they have to work fast, even though we have very large code base and things like indexing might take an enormous amount of time. Uh, and we also want to make a design that makes it plausible for us to build features that would know about the sor all source code of Google, uh, but, work, but still work on developers' workstations that might not even see all the source code that they work on. Um, let's take a look at some of the internal stuff. How do we want to build that? Uh, so Clang D is obviously based on the Clang front end, and all the features that we build are somehow, somehow rely on the C++ parser inside it. And its architecture can be kind of viewed in the layers. On the lowest layer, we have the, uh, we have two components that provide the information that we can use to build all the features. AST cache is the component that talks to Clang. It will build things like ASTs and pre-compiled headers, and it will actually get all the implementations of the nitty details of talking to, the Clang, to Clang and understanding C++. The index, on the other hand, is our abstraction of the project-wide storage. Every time you want to go beyond the current file, you look at the index. Uh, and on top of that, we build features, uh, the familiar ones that you might see in different plugins, like completion and things like that. Usually features talk to both the index and the AST cache and the implementation. But some of them, like say signature help, might just talk to one of the components and that's also fine. And on top of that, we have the layer that actually um, abstracts away the protocol interactions and, um, and converts the, the C++ API that we have into the, the interface that allows, to, that allows you to run it as a, as an, as a language server. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we have this index that is a storage of global information about your project. Uh, Clang CST comes from the compiler, so it doesn't really know anything beyond the current translation unit. It might know some information about the current file and the files that you included into it, but it misses some of the important details. For example, if you want a feature like go to definition, then you might notice that in the current translation unit, you often just have a declaration of say a function that you want to go to. And it means you need to get the definition from somewhere and index is exactly the place where we store such information. Uh, the other example is, uh, say you want to see documentation for the class in your editor, but the current translation unit only has the forward declaration. So you can't really rely on that to, uh, to find the documentation. You need some external storage for that. And the things we store in the index are called symbols. They are also built based on Clang AST, but they are much less detailed. The Clang AST is this tree structure that actually captures all of the uh, parsed C++ tree and 
has all sorts of semantic information to support uh, the C++ language. Index of, uh, indexes symbols are very simple. For example, uh, if you have a class and a function, the things we store in the index look somewhat like that. They are just plain structs. They only con contain strings and enum values and integers. And they will just tell us just enough information that we can use to build our features. The, the symbol for string wrap will just mention that it's a class that is inside namespace LLVM. And the symbol for the function will as well mention just the basic things. But also notice the, uh, the ID field. And it is actually a very important one for us. Uh, the ID is actually, it doesn't look like that. It's just a extrapolation of what it is. Uh, ID is a thing that allows us to deduplicate different symbols between multiple translation units. If you're familiar with the, the notion of USR in Clang AST, uh, then it is exactly that. If not, then USR is just a form of mangled name that will allow you to match different declarations between multiple translation units together. In, in that sense, index is, in, in, in some sense, it works like a linker for your C++ project, not like a compiler. Um, so on this lower level of the architecture where we get all the useful information about your program, we end up with the AST and the index. As I said, AST is only for the current file. It doesn't know any information beyond your current translation unit, but the index knows about all, of your, all the rest of the information that we need. And it would be all well and nice, but when we looked at it, we realized that probably we're not gonna get away with something as simple. Um, at Google, we have just too much source code to fit into memory of your machine. And when we built the index, it became clear that we won't be able to uh, store it in memory on every developer's machine. And we surely won't be able to query it efficiently if we don't provide it as, a, as an external service instead. So what we opted, opted to do is we opted to split the index into two parts. First one is the static index, and it, it actually contains information about all the files in your project, and we want help for it to be fresher than one day old. Because we have a lot of code in the source base, and we need to re-index it, and it takes time. But then we run into a problem where information in the index may actually be stale, so we choose to add another one that knows about some of the files that you have recently touched that were changed after we built the static index. And this one we're gonna keep in memory. And it will try to contain all the same information that the static one, but we hope that because it's small, we, want, we will be able to get away with querying it efficiently, storing it in memory, and not even persistent it in your machine. So we end up with this like three layer uh, source of information thing where the static index knows about all, all the files in your project and it might be old, but it also gives you some useful information. It, it may know things like the number of usages for all the symbols in your, in your index the dynamic index will know, will potentially know fresher information about some of the files that you changed, but it won't have some of the signals that the static index has. And then we have the AST that is always up to date, but unfortunately it lacks some other signals as well. It might not know uh, where the definitions of some, some things are or which file to include if you need to uh, if, you, if you need to get this symbol into your translation unit. And on top of this lower layer that has uh, the, the 
that gives us all the information that we want about your program, we built uh, features, and this is one of the features that we've been working on lately. I wanted to uh, show some improvements to code completion that we were able to do in a short demo. So, uh, this is this is a very simple C++ file. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna try to just run code completion on it. This is just normal plain code completion that you would get. The first observation that we made about code completion is that Clang provides very, very useful results especially when you do things like member completion. If, if you just want to explore the APIs of the classes, then it seems to be just a great choice for you. Uh, you, can also, you can also get useful things like patterns out of it, and we, we don't have any objections to it at all. We thought that like, this could be just plugged into any editor and use directly. That was very nice. But then we noticed that there are cases where it doesn't work as good. Uh, what if I want to complete vector? It seems to be in the completion list, and it works just fine. But when I complete it, it gives me an error. And the error is, of course, because we didn't really include the vector here. We just got lucky. Uh, it was in the current translation unit because uh, some of our includes transitively included the forwarding header. It means that after I do completion, I have to go back and actually add the include. <laughs> and only now would actually work. What if I want to do completion of std map? Huh, it's not in the completion list at all. Because again, the current translation unit doesn't have this information. So what we decided to build instead uh, was a feature that we call global completion. I just need to change some of the things here. Sorry. Mm. So I now re-rank D with different settings that enable the global completion feature. <laughs> and what we wanted to get is what we wanted to get is this. Even though I don't have vector include, if I do something like this, I want it to be added automatically. And it doesn't matter if I have map included or not. I want to have it in the completion. And it, it somewhat provides like more things that I want to, but you get the idea. Like I completed map, it automatically added the include, and it was also in the completion list, even though the uh, even though I didn't have the include before that. That was basically what we wanted to get from completion. I just need to switch back. And figure out how to do this. Ah, good. Almost there. <sighs> Sorry about that.
sorry, going back to the slides. Skip the backup slides. So anyway, what do we want to get from the global completion is, uh, we want the completion results from all headers in your project, not just the ones that you have included in your current translation unit. We, wanna, we also want it to add includes when they are not there. But we immediately notice that the general case is too hard to implement. Because if you look at C++, the lookup rules are extremely difficult. And if you take things like templates into account, then it becomes clear that it is infeasible to implement something like it for global, for global indexes. Because here, say, the reason why you would want completion for flip is because vector of bool is, an implementa uh, is a template specialization. And you need to, to know the full type information. And you need to run the full C++ uh, semantic engine to, to get this information. And for vector of int, you will get an error. And you don't want completion results here. But on the other hand, these things are inside classes. So you probably want to have class definition included anyway before you use them. And if we are smart enough, then vector include will be added when we complete here. So we don't really need to care about that case. And this will allow us to make the completion implementation that is substantially easier to implement on a global scale. So what we decide to do is we will take some of the completion results from the AST, we'll take all the local variables, fields, and all the things inside the current file from the AST, and then we will query the index for the rest of the things that are not there. And we will only query for the things that are on the namespace level. We won't ever return results for completion which are inside classes. Um, and the way we implement that is we first run the Clang front end, supplying with, with the pre-compiled header to make it faster. This is a very well-known optimization. I'm sure you are all familiar with that. It will give us completions and also the list of scopes that we need to, uh, that we need to pass as the query to the index with the query to the index. Then we will call the index. It will also give us some results and we will merge them together with the ones that AST completions gave us. So what are those scopes and why do we need them? Well, consider this simple example. Uh, it might seem that in that specific case, we get all the fields from my class and it should be somewhere in the file. So we just want to query the global namespace, right? Well, it's not really the case. You, because C++ allows using namespaces and other directives, you actually need to get some more context into that. So the way we do it is we say, okay, Clank, could you please say us which namespaces did you try to look in when doing this code completion? And Clank says global namespace and namespace std. And this is exactly the thing that we sent to the index. And query is the identifier that the user typed. But then we run into a different problem. Now you have this beautiful index that contains all the information about your project, but the problem is that the project is too large. So you can't really sort results alphabetically and give top thousand, it just doesn't work. So we're at Google, right? We turn everything into a search problem now. <laughs> we need to do the proper ranking of the results and we need to limit the number of results that the index returns. And the way we do that, we take two things into account. First one is how good the query matches uh, the symbol that is there. And the other signal is how good the symbol uh, itself is For example, if you have a query like unique, and this is what user typed, and you have these symbols, 
then you could see that like it's not really visible, but in bold you have the matches. Uh, we could say that the first match is really good. It is the prefix match of your symbol name. So it will get a high point. And unique PTR is also a pretty good match. And then make unique is a bit worse because it's the second word. And then we look at the number of users in your code base of the symbols. And we see that, well, unique had a pretty good match, but you never used it. Unique PTR, on the other hand, what used to, was used a lot. And the other things were also used more than the first one. So we normalize that to one, we multiply the results, and then we sort them according to this ranking. And because we're at Google, we actually know how to build distributed services to do the fast for large indexes. Not because we're at Google, but like, it makes it easier at Google, probably. <clears throat> so notice that even though unique was a very good match, it is not at the top at all because we never used it in the code base, but it should probably be in the results still. Um, with that, I wanted to conclude and just tell you where we are. So we currently support just basic LSP features. We put a lot of work on making things like global completion and project-wide index properly designed. They are still in experimental state, but we hope to get them going. Uh, the other interesting bit that I don't really have time to talk about is that we also embed Clang D into a web IDE used internally at Google. Uh, for us, it means that now Clang D also runs in the cloud and we have to uh, provide some extension points and care more about things like latency because now, uh, now it's much more sensible. You add, you add the latency of Clang to the server latency and to the uh, latency of sending requests back and forth between the data centers. The other interesting thing is Clang, is, uh, Clang D is not the only language server based on libclang. There is also cQuery. Uh, it's a very good one. It has more features than Clang D. It has a highly optimized memory index for your project, and it will actually build it automatically with, without any intervention from you. The reason why we still think Clang D is useful is because it is designed to run in our environment, and we don't think cQuery would be easy to extend to support Google-wide code bases. Uh, about future plans, we want to add more LSP features, integrate Clang Tidy. Uh, we want to support index while build. This is a thing that works in Xcode currently. Uh, implemented by Apple, it will allow us to uh, produce all the results we need to build the index when you build your project, and it will make building the index for us much simpler and much faster for you. We also noticed that build system integration for the interactive tools is not great. We'll, we have a BOF about that. Uh, please join if, you, if you're interested. Uh, the other interesting bit is that today we got an email at CFE Dev from Alex Lawrence at Apple. Uh, and it seems that Apple is also interested in contributing to Clang D and moving their Leap Clang based tools to Clang D. We're also happy to help with that. Very excited about it. Uh, Thanks to all the contributors, and please try it out. Feedback is welcome. Thanks. So we have five minutes for questions. No questions? Hi, my name is Andrei. So, so for local LLVM development, would you recommend using ClangD or CQuery or maybe you complete me? Have you already used this? I'm using ClangD. <laughs> <laughs> I would recommend that. Uh, <laughs> but also I realize that the features that we have are just not there if you think about the user experience. We require some intervention from you to build the index, for example. Uh, but even without the index, it is pretty usable. So I would say try both. It's probably not a big hassle to check one out, check the other out. The language servers are very easy to set up, but definitely, if just try Clang D, if it doesn't work for you, send us a note saying why. We would be interested. Thanks. <laughs> uh, 
Are there any plans to support cross-references soon? Soon. Uh, we're currently working on polishing the global completion, and cross-reference is probably the next thing we're going to look into. And if uh, I, I'm not sure what the plan for the Apple contributions is, but if Apple folks uh, are interested in implementing that, that will definitely probably come faster. So you, you mentioned when you looked at the you complete me code base that there was a problem working on projects that are a bit C and a bit C++ and a bit Python. Um, a lot of projects now are a bit or a lot C++ and a lot some other language using an FFI. If I want to write a language server protocol for some higher level language that exposes a CFFI, are there hooks in Clang D where I can say I've used this symbol in my wrapper code if someone refactors this, I'd really like this symbol to be updated for me, please. Um, there are no hooks for cross-language support at this point. And yeah, this is definitely probably going to be a hard problem for any LSP-based things, because if you want to do global completions, you kind of need to teach the LSP servers to talk to each other. We haven't really looked in, in, in that space at all. Thank you. Uh, is there any logic behind the, um, the ordering of the include statement that are added, like uh, before the system one? We just run Clang format. So if you have .clang format file that specifies how to ah, okay. how to sort them, we will do the same. Um, hey, um, did you consider using Kaith for indexing? And if not, then why? Kaith is an interesting project. Uh, I don't know if uh, everybody knows what it is. Kaith is uh, a thing that will provide you cross-references, will build the index for cross-references for your project, and they also have a LSP client that provides only cross-references, not code completion and other features. Yes, we, we are thinking about that. Uh, but we don't have a definite answer yet. We, we are considering this, but we haven't looked into that thoroughly. Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. But so how does the static, static part of your system works with various branches that you might have and the, the fixed part of the information that is, I guess, somewhere else in some server, if you have several branches that might differ a lot, how do you handle that? Well, at Google, we don't really have this problem because we have like a linear version history. We use something like Perforce or SVN. Uh, yeah, well, theoretically, the way to solve it for multiple branches is probably to store one index per branch. If you really switch between them a lot, then that might be an option that you want to pursue. Uh, I, I think the BOF about the build system integration w would mention that as well. But yeah, this is definitely something that might be a pain point. I'm not sure we're going to address it because it's not our use case, but this is definitely something worth thinking about. We still have time for one question. No, then, then let's thank our speaker again. Thank you.